I came to my faith in Christ when I was nine years old. He ordered every single step and he knew that that's what I needed to push through the hardest times. And every single step from that point, it said, God, not my will, but yours be done. So the church was my family. He accepted me. He loved me. Hey, can you come speak? You start small. All right, well, welcome to another mastermind here at our event, Doing the Impossible Base here in Orlando, Florida. And by the way, I think we love Orlando. We think we're going to do more events here. But uh, gracing us today is Olympian Shante Lowe. And uh, we have questions for you. Okay. But you got 90 seconds to answer. Oh, that's hard. <laughs> so uh, they got questions about uh, business. They're entrepreneurs in their own endeavors. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it to them and then have them fire away with their questions. Who wants to go first? I have a question. Okay. Um, how much would you say throughout the entire journey, how much of a role has your faith played, played in getting to where you are in it? 100%. 100%. What I didn't recognize is when I was seeing Flojo on that screen, I'm think from the outside, it looked like something that inspired a child. But I didn't understand it was God's calling on my life. He knew me before I was knit together in my mother's womb. And so he ordered every single step and he knew that that's what I needed to push through the hardest times. I came to my faith in Christ when I was nine years old. And every single step from that point, it said, God, not my will, but yours be done. And he has put me on this path to do what I'm doing now, to be able to motivate people and bring those principles of faith back into the work that they do every day. Because he uses our passions to be able to fuel us, to fulfill his purpose here on earth. And so even down to the healing was because of my faith. And so I hope it came across in the talk. I got as close to the line as I can, but it is 100% everything. I've used the line here. <laughs> I have a question. So you said that um, resilience is a muscle that you have to exercise daily. Yes. And I, that really hit me. Like, it seems like you were kind of like God marked you, set you start, uh, apart very young. Yes. So um, there's a lot of different things that you had to overcome. Yeah. What did you do when you felt like like you didn't have any more resilience to tap in. Like but it felt like you kept swinging every time you got hit. Yeah. Like what, did, how did you just keep, like, where did you dig? What, what was that? So um, one of the things that I did is I dug into the word. Mm -hmm. So when I first um, bought a Bible and don't judge me, when I was five, I stole a precious moments Bible. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I think I will be forgiven because the first book that I turned to was Proverbs. It's the book of wisdom. And there was so much practical op application. And I, I remember reading the story, not in Proverbs, so don't say that I'm misquoting the Bible, but I read the story of David and Goliath. And a lot of people think that on that particular day, he went out there and he slung his rock and hit Goliath, but it wasn't that at all. He had already killed the lion. He had already killed the bear. He was accountable in protecting the sheep each and every day so that by the time the big thing happened, he was already prepared. And that's what resilience is. So every single day when we have those small barriers that we have to overcome, somebody cuts us off on the freeway and we want to flip them off, but it's like, <laughs> but you exercise, you exercise that resilience. You exercise that restraint. In the New Testament, Paul talks about I beat my body into submission, not as though I'm trying to get a reward that's on earth, but one in heaven. And so when I think about that, I think about my life and what I do each and every day. How am I going to represent God or get on a platform where I could share with you guys when I'm not acting with integrity every single time that something happens? So I believe that every single word of the Bible is true and God is exactly who he says he is. And so therefore I have to live my life accordingly. Sorry. <laughs> hey, man. Oh, perfect. Look at you. Right at time. Right at time. Snap. Okay. Um, what were some of the characteristics of your parents um, in your life and what that made you like a champion and have all the success? And which of those would you pass on to your kids? So, like, I have to pass this. Yes. That is a phenomenal question. And, you know, because I want to honor my mother and my father, I don't normally on that big stage be able to talk about their lives, but my mom spiraled with addiction. My biological father also spiraled with addiction, addiction so he was in prison my entire life. Mm -hmm. So the church was my family or the people that came around me, my grandmother who stepped in, and I had to start picking and choosing the attributes that I wanted to see 
manifested in my life by watching the people around me. So I had a, a uncle who was a pastor and he had been married to his wife for 50 years. Mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted to be able to have that in my life. So I started watching the dynamic of their relationships. I started watching the kids in school where I had a roommate who said, she was like, oh no, I wouldn't do anything like that. My parents would be so ashamed. I was like, but we're in college, they're not here. She was like, no, but if they ever found out, they would be ashamed. And I started asking her how she was parented, how they talked to her. And when it comes to my kids, we live in a time period where we let the iPad raise our kids. We let YouTube raise our kids. No, it is our job to pour into our kids. Whatever seeds you plant in them, that's, the, that's what you're gonna see come out. And so I started making it a point to learn their love languages and speak to them in their individual love languages each and every day. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So your story is just, you, you've been so forthcoming and just very vulnerable, yeah. right? Um, a lot of women struggle with vulnerability, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what was something that made you say, hey, like, I need to share this information and this story? Like, who was that person or that thing that triggered that? So I used to be so self-conscious, like, I would, you know, whenever you get in a dating relationship, you put your best foot forward, but eventually as time goes on, the weave comes off, the nails come off. That's and unbelievable. It's like, and, it's like, <laughs> and you are who you really are. And sometimes when you actually show who you really are, the relationship completely unfolds. And so because of our unravel, so because of that, when I met my husband, I was like, I like this one. So I took the weave off in the beginning. I said, <laughs> look, this is who I am because I like you so much that I want to make sure that as time goes on, I'm able, that we're going to be able to be together. And when I did that, he accepted me. He loved me. And I realized that I was worthy. So it's the people that you surround yourself with and what you, how they make, create a space for you to be vulnerable and comfortable without judgment. If you have people that are filling you with judgment, cut them loose. Because if you can't be authentically who you are, then who are you? You know, so after that, in that moment, when I'm losing my hair, my husband shaved my head. You know, he helped me shave my head. When, when you talk about a double mastectomy, that's a big part of our femininity. And I knew that there were other women that were struggling with those same insecurities that I was. So whenever you have that first woman take everything off and be vulnerable, then other women feel that it's safe to do the same thing. So I decided to do it on the biggest stage. I have a question. Yes. Uh, my wife was talking. I can just sense and feel the confidence that you have just on stage and your presence. Mm -hmm. And where did that come from? Was it something you're just, it was an innate thing, you're born with it? Did it I know sometimes confidence can come from little wins, mm -hmm. the little wins, the little wins, and then you're full blown confident. Yep. Where did that come from? An early stage, you know, as a kid, or was it more mm -hmm. towards like when you're, you know, in sports? So as a business owner, I've tried several different things, but I know that I'm working according to my strengths. And I know that when I have the opportunity to discover what my weaknesses are, I make it a point to strengthen them. So in your business, it's not only important to understand what you're good at, it's very important to understand what you're not good at. And when you take those, those things that you are not so great at and purposely and intentionally refine, build them up and strengthen them, you walk with confidence because you know you're walking without any weaknesses. And so in my business, when I first started, I started virtually. And it was just, you know, the way that I told you guys, Instagram and head, uh, Facebook hit me up and they were like, hey, can you come speak? But then after that, after I went to, on that trip, I started doing virtual presentations. Once COVID-19 lifted, now I'm starting a business in person and I'm shaking on stage. But I realized that this is my purpose. The people that I'm going to serve need to hear what I had to say and what they'll get out of it is more important than the fear that I have. And so in your business, you know that you're serving other people. You know that it's important and it will change their lives. And so you're able to start on the shallow end Start where your circle of influence is and then gradually build yourself up. Don't go from zero to 1,000 today, but take those baby steps along the way that build your confidence so that when you go out there, you can own the stage like your girl did out there. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. Yeah. I'll go, I, have, I have a question. So what made you decide to say, hey, I've got cancer. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go train. I saw you squatting in the garage. Like I know it's already hard to be. A, I can imagine being an Olympic champion, but going through chemo with that. Yeah, yeah. What made you choose to go through that pain? I thought about every woman when, like, mm. I had shared that statistic years before. You know, you see it on social media. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Mm. Oh, one in eight women. Oh, red ribbon or pink ribbon. But when I was one of the eight, I have five sisters, 
13 female cousins on one side. I have 20 female cousins on the other and they don't know this. And so how is the, what platform do I have in front of me to disseminate this information as broadly as possible? And that's why I decided to do it. So when I had, I had those days where I was vomiting, where I was crying and I was like, oh, should I post this online? No, that's not gonna help anybody. If they see me in my strength, operating out of the love for them, it might help them fight their battle just that much more. Even here at this event, women have come up to me. I was just diagnosed today and your story impacted me. That's why I do this now. Today, so there was two in this group, in this room that came and said that to me. One person that said it was their sister. It happens every time. And so we are impacted. Raise your hand. How many of you guys know somebody with breast cancer? You see? And that's why I do it, and that's why I trained and was able to push through. So your upbringing, your story of, of where you came from and your family, I know sometimes it's private information, mm -hmm. and when you go through that at such a young age, it can be seen as something that you're ashamed of. Yep. How did you become confident in sharing that? Because yeah. that was fun. And I have to do it respectfully because there's other people involved that don't necessarily want that information out there. And so I'll give you one example. Um, after the Olympic Games, Oprah was looking for a specific type of athlete that had experienced what I experienced, but nobody in my family was prepared for it. And so she said, yes, we want you on the show. And I had to say no out of respect for them. But I've had these conversations with them and I started talking to them. How did this make you feel? Just being that child sitting at the food pantry, you know, getting the free lunch at school, having to pick through the, the cornmeal for the mealworm so we could cook, you know, the cornbread. Like, Somebody else is going through that right now. And in my life, because I achieved my goals, yes, I consider it a success, but not everybody's gonna be an Olympian. Somebody wants to be a homemaker. Somebody wants to be a life insurance agent. Somebody wants to do something, but they feel like they can't because their life circumstances have dealt them a raw hand. And I wanna be visible to say, yes, you can. You could do the impossible. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> My question, thank you, by the way, I love your personality, it's amazing. Um, my question would be, what um, suggestion would you give to young women, mm -hmm. especially with social media right now, yes. they see the perfect mm -hmm. and one picture, right? Yep. Um, for them to be encouraged that, you know, you can be vulnerable yep. and how to build confidence from there. That's a great question because sometimes you have the online bullies or the people that are wanting to ridicule you. And I'm going through that now with my 15 year old because they're experiencing things we didn't experience growing up. But you have to take it with a grain of salt. People are putting their best forward on the internet. You are not seeing their reality, their everyday. And when it came to, like for me, I don't have Instagram on my phone. I remember when I was growing up with my grandma and I had the phone to my ear and somebody called me and they were just cussing me out. And, my, and I'm sitting there crying. It was the bullies from school. And my grandma said, now who's the fool? Because you're the one sitting there holding that phone up to your ear. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? Click. And she empowered me to make sure that I did not give them space to live in my head. I did not allow them to be part of my circle. So the same thing's true for you. When you're on social media, share what you feel comfortable sharing Think about the fact that there are going to be trolls there, but do not afraid to use that restrict, block, unlike, report <laughs> button. <laughs> because even the best of the best of the best is going to have haters. But then at the same time, also know who you are. Talk to yourself. Look in the mirror and say, girl, you fly. Encourage yourself because if you can't be your biggest cheerleader, how could you expect other people to see value in you that you don't see in yourself? And don't cross over into arrogance, but you know what I'm saying. Yep. <laughs> I have a question kind of on that one. So with with the younger generation, and I see it a lot on TikTok, I see it a lot around my sister and Gen Z mostly, yep. about this, uh, especially with women, just feeling like uh, everything out there is basically saying that you're uh, repressed beyond victory, yes. right? That victory is new and possible. So, so many yes. women aren't even pushing to be able to build that resilience. Yes. How can we as women here in our company continue to inspire and be a part of that fight of showing that anything's possible. So like, that's why I love sharing the story about Flojo and about my grandmother, because Flojo was so fierce that she made herself visible. She committed to excellence. She didn't have to say a word. She put herself in the position to be seen. So by committing to excellence, she was able to be seen and be visible throughout the entire world where anybody hands down that knows anything about athletics will consider her the most iconic female athlete of all time. My grandmother 
did not belong in that platform as a 45 year old hairdressing mother of six did not belong at the White House singing for the president. But she dared to commit to excellence. She dared to allow her voice to be heard. When you look at that picture, that black woman in a sea of faces that do not look like her, you could say she's powerful. She belongs there. She owns that moment. We didn't even hear her sing. We just saw the picture. And so by you making yourself visible and you empowering the women by com continually feeding them the opposite, I say, pull the weeds and plant the seeds. And that's what I had to do throughout my breast cancer journey because I always had those thoughts, you're gonna die, you're not gonna make it. And immediately I would look for somebody who had my same cancer, same age, who successfully went through it, 30 years cancer free. And I use that as my example. Create those visual reminders that you could follow after and use as inspiration and immediately pull up the mental weeds because that is the biggest battle. It's in your mind. On that piece of it, um, talking about how God speaks. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a college pastor before I got into insurance. Whoop, whoop. And, um, FCA. <laughs> I know a lot of folks, uh, they think they struggle with hearing God's voice mm -hmm. when he speaks. And in my experience, he speaks a million different ways. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine fighting through and, and, and overcoming everything you overcome, mm -hmm. how many millions of stories you have of just God's affirmation, him speaking yes. there, a sign here or there. Yes. And um, if you're open, do you have just like one story that you love to share that's like, man, I just know that okay. that was God speaking. So I've never shared this before, but I've always, you've given me the platform, so I think it's time. Um, I used to have a big knot about a golf ball size in my throat. If you go back to my 2019 world championship photo, you will see it mm. there. And after they discovered the breast cancer, they were saying, we're gonna have to test that too. The likelihood and the way that cancer spreads, there's a probability that that's cancer too. And so I was at home and I, I was on my way to go get the biopsy. When I went to back out of my house, there was a big giant, you know, well, you guys aren't from Florida. There's these big giant dinosaur birds. And so it was block, it was about three foot tall blocking our car. We could not get out of the driveway. And eventually my husband went around. I said, okay, if there's two more signs, I'm not going. I thought about the mule on the road. And so it was two more signs. So then I went to the second, we, there was an accident. And I was like, okay, that's two. And then we went in to go get the biopsy. The lady did not know what side of my neck, which was, she was like, what side is it? I was like, it's obviously in the middle. And she was drunk. And I was like, nope, that's three. And I left. I was like, it's not time. I'm not getting the biopsy. I started saying, um, confessing scripture. I shall live and not die to declare the works of the Lord. Start confessing it every single day. A week later, later, they told me that this was solid, more solid than muscle. And I was like, okay, Lord, I believe that it will. Oh, I can't believe I'm sharing this. I believe that the solid will turn to a liquid and they will be able to take it out the day that I go get the biopsy. So they go in to do the biopsy a week later. They put the needle in to, to take out potato plugs. And I'm gonna make me cry. And, they, they, and they're like, wait, we can't get anything. Hold on, let me try something. They get the other syringe, put it in my neck, suck the entire thing out. It has not came back. That is a miracle. And God spoke to me in that moment. <laughs> and the liquid was non-cancerous. Wow. So I can't believe I'm sharing that, y'all. It happened. <laughs> so we, had, we got an exclusive story. Exclusive. Wow. Only my husband knows that. And if you look at the pictures, it is a massive knot. And I didn't even notice it. Wow. It's, it is there. Yep. Post-production, you could put the picture in. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, for sure. We're, we're, we're looking for you. You get it. Uh, thank you for your wisdom. What do you tell a woman, because uh, I'm Mexican, Latino, yep. there's a lot of macho men and whatnot, mm -hmm. and a lot of women live under the shadow of either their husband, mm -hmm. parents, or somebody. Yep. What do you tell a woman that is there, like, holy, like, she yes. just explodes? Yes. You start, you start small. You start small, you start building your confidence. What you speak to your, yourself, you have power of life and death in your tongue. So what you speak to yourself is gonna be evident in your life. If you have people that are constantly oppressing you, respectfully, especially if it's family, start distancing yourself in ways to where you can expound and grow outside of being underneath somebody else's thumb. And it's like what I tell my daughter, a lot, a lot of women, lack the confidence. We're told our whole lives, we can't do the things that boys do. And I remember in college, I used to high jump with this young man. And I absolutely loved him, but we, he jumped the American record which for women. But every time that I competed against him at practice, my coach would spot him a foot. And I'm like, 
if I could lift as much as you, and if I could run as fast as you can, then I should believe that I could be able to jump as high as you. I started working, started working. I watched what he did. I watched how, he, how much he lifted. I started doing the same thing. And one day I practiced, it happened. <laughs> you beat him. I beat him. <laughs> I beat him. I ended up jumping what? six, eight at practice. And then um, a little bit later, I ended up jumping the American record. And at that moment, he wanted to quit because he's like, everyone's been telling him also, women should never beat you. But then at that moment, I had the opportunity to become a leader. And I said, look, I made a target out of you. But you, if you make a target out of somebody else, do not quit. Keep going because there's greater things than you. The next year, he ended up jumping a foot higher. And so, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, finish that, but finish that thought. But it's like he ended up going a step higher because he believed in that process. There's a process. Mm -hmm. And you have to, if you're a leader, even though you may elevate over somebody else, are you going to go back and say, ha ha, I'm at the top? Or are you going to go back, reach down and help pull them up and elevate them? So there's so much power in that, especially as a woman, if you are able to triumph over a male performance, be gracious. You, kick, you definitely kicked my butt and I jump. <laughs> 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 I, I, I jumped 410. <laughs> she hurdles it. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. So this could be for men or for women, but a lot of times I think when they're going through struggle, it's really easy for self-talk or the adversary for sure mm -hmm. to convince that you should isolate, that you should become small, that mm -hmm. you should not have a voice. Um, when obviously the opposite is mm -hmm. clearly your, your message. For yeah. someone who doesn't feel they have the platform or is kind of stuck in that space, what would be your encouragement to them? I would say grow where you're planted, start there. Um, even in trying to, to refine my skills as being a speaker and being able to share, because this is my testimony. This is the life and you can't walk through this story without seeing God in each and every part of this. And so I started small doing free events at Rotaries. And, you know, there were opportunities to be able to share and it was non-intimidating, but I was able to gain confidence and know that I'm walking out what God called me to do. Obviously, the enemy's job is to steal, kill and destroy. And so you have to understand that you're constantly going to be fighting against that. But the same thing is we have protection in declaring the word. We could read the scripture. We need to know what's in there and we need to know how to use it as a weapon. It's our sword. And so if you're walking through life, not using your sword, yes, you're going to get attacked. You're going to get beat up and you're not going to win. Mm -hmm. Know how to wield your sword. Oh my gosh. I didn't know I was coming to church today. Amen. <laughs> before, before, you, before you wrap up, uh, uh, Sable Ote, reached out to a common friend of yours. Mm -hmm. And the way you guys greet, can, can you come, can you come, right? Moshami. Yeah, yeah, Moshami. yeah, Sable, come here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, can, can you, uh, before we wrap up, can you, can you explain, can you explain this relationship yes. here? So can you explain to everybody who this, who this uh, wonderful woman is? And, and by the way, can you, uh, yeah. There we go. Can you bust out that metal too? <laughs> yeah, yes. it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a. So this is, and I did not know she was going to be here. Uh -huh. um, she tried to make me cry. I told you guys I have magnet magnetic eyelashes on, so if I cry, they're coming off. <laughs> um, this is Mashami Robinson. She was actually on my first Olympic team with me. And so we've been going through this journey almost, almost two decades going back. In one year, it will be two decades. Yeah, and so she's here. She's watched the journey. I've watched her become a mother. I was the first. <laughs> she was the second. She was the second, and so just, um, now she's dedicated so much of her life towards influence, influencing young um, athletes and young children. And now, you know, she's transitioned to being able to um, just to use her same story. And, and she's inspired me so much. And so do <laughs> just to see her here. Yeah, it was really good to be here with her. Um, I know Shantae at, at all levels and to have a friend that you reverence and is someone personal and then you get to see them share their story and you know see how god has really used them and allow them to be a vessel to bless everyone else i think i was overwhelmed with emotion because i know her in a different way you know but to see god elevate you know like she said this journey 
and see so many people receive from her, you know, I'm grateful. My heart is full because I, that makes me more affirmed in what God showed us years and years ago. And it just affirms what that faith walk looks like on a daily basis, even, um, you know, going through her journey and praying with her. Yes. Um, I think for what inspired us women and athletes who watched her is that she kept going, you know, she had a baby and kept going. Um, she had another child and kept going. Then she got sick and kept going. And it's kind of like, that's what perseverance looks like. That's what that internal fight looks like. And no one can tell you to keep going. You have to go within, you have to push past those limiting beliefs. And to see her on stage today, I've never seen her share her story to strangers or to people that she doesn't know personally. And she shared it like she was talking to me in our living room. And that for me was just so awe inspiring. And I just was praying over the room as she shared her story because I have not been in a space where God has been able to be elevated um, and people get to hear throughout about triumphs and be able to put that into your own lives and to hear it come from a friend, um, a sister and see how God elevates someone that you love so dearly. It just affirms why we're here um, and that everyone was designed to be here at this point in time. And I was so grateful to surprise her because I believe in everything that she does and, and we have to show up for each other. Yeah. Before we let you go, quick 30 seconds from you both. What's your observation of this event's a room full of insurance agents, mm. the way PHP style does so, it. So first of all, you guys break the norm. You're, you never see so many women or minorities. There's constantly, we're constantly being told there is not a space for us in this industry. And you guys have decided to completely ignore all of that, <laughs> break the mold, and then crush the competition. Come on. Yeah. So I was incredibly thrilled, especially the music y'all played. But I am so incredibly honored to be part of this group. You have created something amazing here in Awache, husband and wife dynamic mm. duel. That, and so many husbands and wives in here. You guys are teams, and I am incredibly honored to be part of your victory ceremony because that's what this is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So much. Look, I, I was invited. I came to see Shante speak and I said, um, after I heard Sable speak, I texted him like, that's powerful, powerful, powerful. Then I heard two more speakers. Your wife was moderating. And it was after the third speaker, I finally leaned over when I heard God and faith about the fourth time. And I said, what do you all do here? <laughs> I said, I, what, what is this? I, I, I was ready to sign up for the team. I should probably know what we're doing and where we're going. And so when I found out, I said, wow. Because all I heard was edification of each of you and then teaching you how to be a blessing to other people mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. service leadership. And that's what I had to ask, what is this? And so to see so many minorities, um, men, women alike, um, being a blessing and are blessed to be a blessing. I tell people that um, prosperity comes with proximity to God mm -hmm. because when you are in aligned with his vision, then everything comes in right on the other side of fear is our greatest accomplishments, mm -hmm. right? And so when we can push past those limited beliefs, hold on to God's unchanging hand and keep pouring into each other. What you yeah. get is everything great. What you get is this, what yep. you get is fellowship. So yeah, now that I know that it's insurance, <laughs> sign me up in yeah. my <laughs> 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 Thank <laughs> you.